Good morning, I'm Annie Larkin, Associate Curator of Public Programs at the Ameren Museum, and welcome to Native American Women in the 21st Century with Mary Jo Fox. Before we begin the program today, I want to acknowledge that Ameren is located in southeastern Arizona on lands where the Otham, Hopi, Ashwi, and Apache families lived for untold generations, and whose wisdom and traditions live on today in vibrant communities. We are grateful for what all of these communities rich in history, have to teach us. Thank you to our members and donors who enable Ameren to provide free online programming and fulfill Ameren's mission to promote the knowledge and understanding of the native peoples of the Americas through research, education, conservation, and community engagement. To learn how you can assist Ameren in supporting its mission and programs by becoming a member or donor, please visit Ameren.org. As a reminder, the Ameren Museum is open with safety protocols in place, such as requiring the use of masks and social distancing. To plan your trip to Ameren, please go to the visit section of our website, ameren.org. On Saturday, June 19th at 11 a.m., Ameren will host the free online gallery talk through the lens of Navajo photographer Priscilla Ticini. Please visit the events section of our website, ameren.org, or the events section of Ameren's Facebook page for registration details. Then on July 24th at 11 a.m., Ameren will host the free online program, Water Flow, Water Quality on the Hopi Reservation with photographer Kathleen Bello. Again, please visit the events section of Ameren's website or Facebook page for registration details. All right, Dr. Mary Jo Fox is Comanche in Cherokee, an enrolled member of the Comanche Nation of Oklahoma. She is Research Professor of American Studies and Affiliate Faculty of, in Gender Studies and Women's Studies in, at the University of Arizona. She holds a PhD in Higher Education from the University of Arizona. At the UA, Dr. Fox is the former head of American Indian Studies, Associate Head of American Indian Studies, Assistant Vice President for Minority Affairs, and Associate to the President for American Indian Affairs. Her teaching and scholarly activities are focused on historical and contemporary American Indian women's issues, American Indian studies, and American Indian education with an emphasis on higher education. So if you would like to ask any questions to Dr. Fox during the program today, please type your questions in the Q&A chat box and we will be gathering those questions to share with Dr. Fox after her presentation. And thank you so much for joining us today, Mary Jo. Yeah, you're welcome. All right, handing it over to you now. Okay, uh, greetings everyone. Um, LCO uh, Montdua Wika. I'm greeting you in, um, first Cherokee and then in Comanche language. Um, also, I sense I am coming from uh, uh, Tucson and, and uh, sitting here at the U of A in my office, I would also like to acknowledge that I'm on the indigenous lands of the Tohontem in the Paspo Yaqui. Um, and it's been my privilege to not only work in their lands, but to have, uh, uh, to live here. And I really appreciate that. Okay, so who am I? Uh, you know, I am Comanche and Cherokee and, and, and uh, enrolled a Comanche, or what we say, Nunama, which means the people. And I come from the Kiwana Band, which is the Antelope Band on my Comanche side. On the Cherokee side, I come from the Eagle Clan. And so these pictures here of, are some of my the people that are important in my life. And uh, uh, so we see here my grandfather, Tipakani, and my grandmother, Winnerchi. And then my Cherokee grandfather, Tom Eagle, and then my parents, John and Juanita Tipakani. It's important to know when you live in native communities, you know, people want to know who are your people, who are you related to, how do you fit into the community? So this is why, you know, this is who I am and this is, is how I identify myself and the people that I identify with. As was said before, my academic background, I do have a PhD in 
higher education from the University of Arizona. And my teaching and research focus is on American Indian higher education and historical and contemporary Native women's issues. And way back in the mid 90s, um, I developed a class on American Indian women for uh, American Indian studies. And it's now cross-listed with gender and women's studies. Uh, and this class has been, you know, I've been teaching it almost every year for, since I started it. And, you know, it's, it's, a, bit, it's a fun class. I, I get students from all over the university, from all different disciplines. But usually at least half the class are native people, native women uh, and some native men. And it's very interesting. I've been teaching this so long that now I'm teaching, you know, the children of uh, former students. So I've been in higher ed for over you know, 35 years. And, you know, so I have had a lot of experiences and seen a lot of things happen. And this is just, you know, a little bit of the description of the class that I teach and some of the students that uh, uh, I had in one semester in my class. But uh, the outline for my, my presentation is a course titled Native American Women in the 21st Century, Activism, Advocacy, and Resistance. And some of the things that I will cover is the reasons for highlighting Native women, uh, status roles before and after contact, early activists, uh, advocates and reformers, contemporary activists and advocates, political leaders, indigenous feminism, and new ears of activism, and then some final thoughts. So reasons for highlighting Native women. Uh, you know, first is that, you know, I want to make them more visible because a lot of times Native women and Native women's issues are invisible. We don't see, you know, uh, many native, uh, many mainstream people and populations don't know much about them unless they live close to them or have some contact with them. So, you know, but yet these issues are important, not only to native community, but to society in general. So I feel like by highlighting them, it does make them more visible. But also I like to acknowledge and honor Native women who've paved the way, you know, who've paved the way for me. And that's made my life more manageable and my career more manageable. And this is a way to honor some of those women. And then also to recognize Native women as players and contributors to tribal sovereignty, nation building, self-determination, preservation of culture, traditions, gender issues, and just the community well-being. A lot of times, you know, we hear uh, uh, men, Native men highlighted, but we don't always hear those contributions from Native, about Native women. So, and yet they have contributed and they are contributing. And then also I like to educate and correct stereotypes because Native people in general are still very much stereotyped you know, and especially women, you know, this romantic image of women, like you see here with the Pocahontas and, and uh, these uh, uh, costumes that Native women are in here. They're marginalized, they're sexualized, you know, and that's not the correct image. That's not the true image. So, you know, to learn a little bit about that, maybe we can correct some of those stereotypes. That can be very damaging uh, to Native people. And just to finally, just to honor these, some of these select Native women that we'll talk about today in this presentation, you know, because Native women sometimes are very humble because that sometimes is a cultural value within their culture. And so, you don't, they don't always get that recognition. So we're gonna first look at the status and roles before and after contact. So uh, before contact, you know, um, there was seemed to be more balance between the gender roles. You know, society, Native societies really could not function without each uh, gender doing their part uh, in order to make the, uh, the society work. They had more complementary roles, uh, maybe not so equal, but complementary. They both had influence, they both had impact. 
of course, you know, we also have to take into consideration that there was diversity in tribes. So if you look at particular tribes, you know, some are matrilineal, some are patrilineal. And so, you know, you have to look at those to see just what those roles were. But, but usually they were complementary. They had to both have specific things in order to make that society function. But we know, you know, there are women that, you know, are in creation stories, like changing woman in the Diné culture, uh, spiritual leaders, uh, which, you know, the Osage had. Uh, but generally, women were respected and influential. They had a, a voice. Um, and they were essential, of course, because they were the bearers of the children. And if we look at this statement by me, Madison, who is, who is a Lakota, was a Lakota elder and scholar. And she's talking about her tribe, which is matrilineal. Uh, our societies are patrilineal in terms of kinship. Male and females work together to keep the family and the kinship necklace, nexus intact in order to maintain the nation. There was always balance between men and women. You know, and she's talking from, uh, uh, you know, uh, patrilineal tribe, but there are many uh, uh, matrilineal tribes too, where the line went through uh, the mother. But of course, this changed on contact when settlers came here and and wanted to stay. And of course, native you know people uh, were on the land, and so they and settlers needed the land. So Indians became a problem. So what are we going to do with them? Uh, you know, and so. And these societies, most of them uh, that were settling here, uh, were uh, patrilineal societies. Men were, you know, kind of in charge. And so they refused to deal with women or listen to Native women. So they just kind of became invisible. Uh, and so, you know, they lost some of that, their roles and their status uh, uh, on contact because of they wouldn't deal with them. The mainstream society would not deal with them. And some of those ideas of, of changing gender too, to more reflect the gender of those settlers, you know, was became, you know, government policy. And they implemented this through education, religion, you know, civilizing native people, uh, making them, you know, more like, uh, uh, the non-native population. So, you know, some of those attitudes are still there in our, in our cultures. Yet women resisted and tried to, you know, uh, help their communities and uh, resilience and perseverance. You know, we have, you look at the scholarship, you know, you'll see that even when, um, like with Cherokees, you know, during the removal time when uh, the government wanted to remove them from Georgia to Indian Territory. Women spoke up, you know, even though, you know, um, they weren't necessarily in charge yet, that that was a matrilineal tribe. They, you know, they, they made their voices be heard that they would opposed it. Uh, of course, that didn't, uh, you know, that didn't stop removal, but they, you know, they tried to make a difference. The picture here is of uh, Comanche women in the 1800s. And uh, you will notice once we got uh, uh, access to material cloths and stuff, this is what uh, they wore and they're called uh, tea dresses because uh, they're the form of the dress is in a tea. And uh, that became kind of a, a traditional way of dressing after contact. Okay, those that paved the way for future generations, some of our early activists and advocates and reformers. And, you know, these activists and reformers, you know, dealt with certain issues. You know, we're just going to talk about some, select them. There's many more out there, but the ones we'll talk about dealt with tribal rights, health and wellness, and native rights. Okay, the first one with tribal rights was Sarah Winnemucca, who was an activist, autobiographer, and interpreter. And she was Paiute from what is now N Nevada. And, you know, she learned English. She was educated and learned, went to school and, and learned English. So she became kind of an interpreter and, and 
uh, liaison between uh, her tribal people, the Paiutes and non-natives. And, but, you know, as, as people came in and were settling around her people, you know, they were trying to be, they were being displaced, you know, uh, moving them around, taking more of their land uh, because settlers wanted that to settle on them. And, and of course, government was, you know, putting us on reservations and et cetera. But these abuses were happening and there was theft of property uh, happening. And so she, you know, tried to defend that uh, Paiute rights by trying to talk to non-natives and trying to get them to understand what was happening to her people. And so, you know, she ended up giving like, you know, 400 speeches across the country, across the United States, really from coast to coast, you know, talking about some of these abuses that were happening and trying to get people to understand it and to try to uh, defend uh, the rights of her people. But also she wrote, she, she was, wrote the first book written by a native woman in 1883. Uh, life Among the Paiutes. You can see this picture here. And, you know, it documents, she documented, you know, the history of her people, but also, you know, some of the abuses that were happening uh, to them as people settled in their country and, and government, you know, uh, handled Indian affairs. But a quote I think that was very telling is this one up here. The woman knows as much as the man uh, and their advice is often asked, the council tent is our Congress, and anyone can speak who has anything to say, and that's women and all. And she's saying, if women could go into your Congress, I think justice would be soon done for Indians. So I think that's a very, you know, powerful statement about, you know, the influence of, of, of uh, Paiute women. And she's, you know, trying to express that to uh, uh, non-native culture. Uh, another woman is uh, that dealt with health and wellness uh, is Susan LaFleche uh, Peacock. Uh, she's all Omaha, and she's the first female native doctor and and she got her degree in you know in 1889 when this you know wasn't real common for women to be uh, doctors and yet she was a native woman and became a doctor uh, after earning her medical degree she went back home to Nebraska to serve her people because she felt that that was you know that was her calling and in uh, among her community, you know, she advocated for, you know, modern hygiene practices and disease prevention. And in a, in a way that was a very challenging thing because they were used to, you know, uh, practicing traditional medicines and sometimes, and sometimes this, you know, went against that. So she, you know, had to convince that, you know, this is what's good for the people. But she also, you know, saw how communities were being destroyed by, you know, alcohol and, and how uh, Native people were um, uh, uh, being, um, you know, uh, given alcohol uh, when, when non-Natives were trying to take advantage of them in some way or, and then, you know, it, it got out of hand. So she really did advocate, you know, for against uh, alcohol and how it was destroying uh, her people due to the colonization and, the, and government policies that was making alcohol more available to, to uh, her people. And then she became a lobbyist too. She lobbied with her sister who was kind of honest, uh, uh, was also a lobbyist on Indian rights. And both of them, you know, would speak at different audience, audiences in in different forums about, you know, laws that contribute to dependency and demoralization of her people. Then we look at uh, native rights and, and um, we look at uh, Sik Hassal and Gertrude Bowen 
and she was uh, 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 from the Dakota Sioux. And she was really into Indian rights. She was an Indian rights activist and advocate. And she really did advocate for full citizenship for native people. You know, uh, not just the right to vote, but full privileges for, for native people. Also for educational opportunities, health care, and cultural recognition and preservation of, of, uh, of tribal um, customs and, and traditions through her writings. She was a writer and an editor, and she would write pieces for, you know, magazines and for newspapers, but also, you know, she was a musician. And so, you know, she um, uh, also gave um, those kinds of uh, uh, recitals. But during all of this, you know, she was really using her skills, uh, you know, and, and she dedicated her life to justice for Native people. She spoke out about it. And so she's considered one of the most important Indian rights activists of the 20th century. Uh, her actions uh, were an extension, she felt, of her ancestors' struggle for recognition and sovereignty. And so, you know, that was, was something that she carried on throughout her life. And she did uh, help founded the National Council of American Indians. And this was an organization in 1926 that had, you know, many uh, uh, prominent Native um, uh, people on it, such as Carlos uh, Montezuma, who comes from uh, Fort McDowell, uh, Charles Eastman, uh, uh, Angel de Cora, who was, uh, uh, you know, some of these Native people that uh, had been educated and had achieved in, in, in uh, mainstream society, and they were, you know, advocates for Indian rights. Then we see, you know, more contemporary activists and advocates later on. And some of these issues are, uh, we're gonna talk about a little bit, are violence against indigenous women, some justice issues, and of course, missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. This quote by, uh, Bonnie Claremont says, women's sovereignty is central to Indian sovereignty because a nation cannot be, be free if their women are not free. And, you know, she was in uh, an advocate for um, uh, Native women against domestic violence. So the, the domestic violence movement started in the 1970s in Indian country at the grassroots level. Uh, you know, Native women um, saw that uh, their fellow women, some of them were being abused. And, and uh, so they opened their homes to them and then to their children so that they would have a safe place to come. And so this kind of began, you know, this led to the development of shelters uh, native, uh, for women on reservations. But, you know, women just took this issue into their own hands and tried to do something about it because it wasn't being handled otherwise. So these were grassroots efforts that grew into a real national movement that is over 50 years old in Indian country. And if you look at, you know, uh, this movement and some of the uh, laws that have been passed, like the Violence Against Women's Act, especially in, in 2013, you will see that Native women were significant players in getting it passed through Congress. And then also to make sure that Native women were included in this legislation. And so they have really become a voice, you know, in promoting this. And, and they're also continuing to be a voice in the reauthorization of VAWA, which is happening right now in Congress. So, you know, this is really continuing some of that traditional roles of Native women as, you know, protectors and of their community and looking out for the well-being of the community. So where we are seeing that those traditional uh, roles and continuing today. And when you look at the domestic violence uh, movement that is in Indian country, that came out of Indian country, you will 
come across the name of Matilda, uh, Matilda Tilly Black Bear. And because she's considered, you know, the grandmother of the battered women's movement in Indian country. Uh, you know, she's, and also, you know, not just recognized as one of the founders of domestic violence in Indian country, but in, in the U.S., you know, because she has, she was a real force and a voice for this movement. Uh, she um, started, the, you know, this movement on her Rosebud Reservation. And then she, you know, it went nationally to many native communities all over the country and, that's, and to, you know, mainstream. And then she was also, you know, a founder of the White Buffalo Calf Women's Society, which are women's societies uh, that we have in, our, in, in her community. But she also, you know, helped establish the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence, uh, in South Dakota, Coalition Against Domestic Violence, and then also the National Indigenous Women's Resource Center. And the National Indigenous Resource Center is a very good source uh, and advocacy uh, group that's very active in, in uh, looking and promoting um, uh, Indigenous women's kind of issues and really fighting for, you know, uh, safe protection for Native women. And so, you know, she started that organization. So her, you know, she's, she's thought of very highly when you think about domestic violence. In October, you know, it's usually domestic violence month. And so when that happens, you know, in Indian country, they try to honor uh, uh, Tilly for all the work that she did. Uh, and, and, you know, and her say, you know, and, and she emphasized also that violence was not necessarily a traditional way of Indian, Indian, um, in Indian society. We had ways of dealing with it. Different tribes had different ways of dealing with abuse and when it did happen. But, you know, she has really, you know, um, uh, took this, this, this movement on and really made a difference. And it's, it's continuing today and people are remembering her for that. Now, when you look at uh, justice issues, uh, Eloise P. Uh, Cobell is someone that, uh, her name is Yellowbird Woman in, in her tribal, uh, it's her tribal name, uh, and she's Blackfoot. But she was a tribal leader, an activist, uh, a rancher, but really she's known what she's coming to be really known about is uh, she was the lead plaintiff in the groundbreaking class action suit, Cobell, Cobell versus Salazar. And this case, you know, really challenged the, the US government for its mismanagement of trust funds. Funds, money that belong to more than 500,000 individual natives. Uh, you know, and, and what this was, was like, you know, on trust lands, if they um, uh, individual lease those trust lands, uh, that money was supposed to go into individual accounts that the Bureau maintained for them, or they had resources developed on their land and they had money, those, that money was supposed to be put into those funds. But she's, you know, she, from her um, you know, looking at this issue and, and becoming familiar with it, she saw that, you know, a lot of this money was not getting to, uh, you know, the right individuals. So, you know, she challenged the government, she took it to court. And, you know, finally in, in 2010, it was uh, settled and there was an approval for $3.4 million uh, as, as a result of, of uh, settling the case and, and, and so some of this money was then compensated back to the individual account holders are their descendants because some of them were, were already had already passed. And then also some of the money was used to buy lands, you know, that had been inherited by uh, different Indian people, but they were in small proportions. And so that land was uh, bought back and restored into uh, the reservation lands. Then also we see, you know, that there was a scholarship fund and that scholarship fund is funding many native students that are going through 
higher education. But yet that was the largest class suit against the government. And, you know, she's credited with, you know, look, finding, identifying this issue and then pursuing it so that justice can happen. Um, and she was honored in 2016 by President uh, Obama with the Presidential Medal of Freedom. And her son accepted that medal on her behalf. So, you know, she, uh, you know, really, um, you know, made a difference and, and made the uh, government be accountable for that mismanagement. That's, and then another movement that's really prominent in Indian country right now is, is the missing and murdered indigenous women and girls movement. Uh, you know, this quote says, every time I see a photo of an indigenous woman or girl who has gone missing, I feel my spirits tighten inside me. This is Helen Knox. But, you know, this is something, um, you know, that has, that really kind of, um, came to focus in Canada, in the Vancouver area, where, um, you know, there was this number of, of Native women that were being murdered and nobody, you know, was being uh, arrested or uh, tried for those murders. Or, and then several Native women were being just, they're missing. Nobody knew what happened to them. Their families didn't know what was happening to them. Uh, you know, so that became a real issue in, in uh, Native women, you know, and that in some First Nations, you know, really started looking at it because it involved, you know, not only the woman that was missing or murdered, but their families, you know, and et cetera. Uh, so it, you know, it really started there, but it's very much uh, in the United States now and a very much uh, a concern. Uh, one of the concerns is that, you know, the, the data, the statistics, how many, you know, because uh, numbers were not always kept, you know, we don't have the correct numbers. Uh, these numbers come from the Urban Indian Health Institute, but, you know, people feel like they're, you know, they're much higher. Uh, the latest figure I saw was, you know, at least uh, 5,000 but we know there's more. And this, you know, keeping uh, uh, correct data and updating data has become a real issue for uh, people that are advocating for this in this movement. And as I said, you know, it, it really it, uh, came a focus in, in Canada in the Vancouver area, but also some of First Nations scholars have, you know, really uh, written about this and it really, uh, brought it to the forefront for, for people to look at. Uh, and these, uh, some of these native scholars here are, you know, Kim Anderson, Maria Campbell, uh, Christy Belcourt. And, you know, they have really, um, you know, added to the dialogue what's really happening so that we get a clearer picture. And so these are some of the, the, uh, the book that came out about on Missing and Bird Women by Kim Anderson and Campbell and Balcourt. And it's a very good book. It talks about, you know, not only the situation in Canada, but also in, in the United States and how it's affecting families, how it's, you know, what is really there, what is really happening. And it's a very good book. Uh, and in fact, I've used it in my class, in my women's class, but they have also been involved in events, in, in exhibits, in, in um, activities uh, to promote this and to inform, you know, uh, uh, the communities and societies, you know, about this issue, that it, it really is a, a serious issue in Indian country. And also to help families, you know, deal with, uh, with their, their, their loved ones being uh, murdered or are missing. And we see that, you know, happening in here in the Southwest, you know, usually there's a women's march you know, generally in, in the United States in January, but, you know, and but in DC, but we also see that there are women's marches during that same time in different communities. And we're seeing that Native women are becoming a part of those march to bring focus, you know, to the issues of 
of Native women. And one of those issues, of course, is the missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. And we see here the picture of an organization, of uh, 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 Toho Autumn organization and Toho Autumn uh, in the march in Tucson. Then also a symbol of missing in indigenous uh, women and girls is the red dresses. So during, you know, when these marches and, and now there's a national day of awareness for missing and murdered women, which is on May the 5th. And so, you know, you will see during that time uh, displays of red dresses. And this is to bring the issue to the forefront and to remember those that we have lost and to remember those that are still missing. Uh, and the National Indigenous Women's Resource Center, which Tilly helped you know, establish, is one of the leaders that, that really um, you know, is getting the information out about how we can participate and um, acknowledge this day you know, by wearing red, by, you know, uh, hosting a prayer circus, a candlelight visual, list names of missing sisters out there. But, you know, just to remember and to bring the issue to a forefront. But we've also seen, you know, um, Native women lead issues at not only the national level to get, you know, an acknowledgement day of May the 5th, but also to get legislation that will help address this problem. And we've seen that, you know, legislation in, in Congress that's being looked at and, and uh, a place uh, developing how we can get better statistics and better numbers to know actually, you know, how extensive this problem is. But we're also seeing it in the states. And, you know, Arizona is, is, is one of those. And we see here the picture of, of uh, Native women in Arizona that were lobbying the state legislature, you know, to acknowledge this issue and to try to do something about it. Also, we have, you know, Native women, of course, in the uh, political arena. Uh, you know, Native women that are really out there, you know, trying to make a difference with Native rights, social justice, leadership, governance and policy and, and policy making. It's like this quote here from uh, Audrey Shenandoah. Sovereignty is the ability to carry out your own direction. If you think sovereign, you can be sovereign. So when we think about native rights and social justice, you know, one of the, the, the people we can think about and have thought about is Ada Deer. She is my nominee. And she was the first Native woman to head the Bureau of Indian Affairs. You know, a significant, you know, position because of, of uh, uh, its oversight of many things in Indian country. And uh, Ada also is remembered in her tribe because the Menominees were um, terminated, you know, their trust, uh, their federal status was terminated in the 50s. And, you know, was, that was devastating to her tribe. And she led that uh, effort to get them back to being uh, fairly recognized. So she's noted, you know, in her tribal community for that, but also for, you know, uh, trying to make a difference for Indian country by leading the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Um, once she left government, she became, you know, she went to academia and the University of Wisconsin. Uh, she is now uh, retired, but she has written a book, and this you can see the, the cover of this book, Making a Difference, My Fight for Native Rights and Social Justice. Uh, you know, and, and she you know, profiles her life, the things that, you know, that some of the challenges and some of the things she dealt with. And we have a little, you know, blurb here from one of her fellow um, uh, uh, political activists, LaDonna Harris here. Making a difference, the powerful story of activism. Ada Deer contributed her indigenous worldviews and Menominee cultural identity to help shape Indian affairs of the 21st century. You know, so it's a powerful endorsement of it. Uh, the picture here is of Ada with, with myself and 
two of my U of A colleagues uh, in the late um, uh, 90s, we had the National Indian Education Association Conference here in Tucson, and she was one of the keynote speakers. And so, uh, you know, she was gracious enough to spend some time with us. So uh, I felt fortunate to know her. And then, of course, another tribal leader that, that many of us know are, is Wilma Man Killer, uh, and she's Cherokee. Um, she was the first female principal chief of the Cherokee Nation in Oklahoma. And, you know, she's known for her activism and, and also, uh, you know, proclaiming that she is a feminist, you know, which wasn't always popular in, in, with Native women and in Native uh, uh country at that time that she was doing it. Uh, she's also an author um, and, you know, we have honored her at the University of Arizona in the Arizona Women's Plaza. Uh, but she was really an advocate, you know, for community development, you know, for communities and nation building, uh, self-help, communities helping themselves and education and healthcare programs. Uh, not only in Cherokee country, but in, in any country in general. But, you know, when she went up to run for uh, first female principal chief, you know, she encountered a lot of biases, you know, biases against women holding those positions. Uh, you know, um, you know, some kind of, uh, you know, women shouldn't hold those positions. Those positions are only for men. She, you know, experienced sexism and et cetera. And this is really interesting because, you know, when you look at Cherokee, the Cherokee Nation, they're a matrilineal tribe, you know, but, you know, she had to kind of re-educate uh, and uh, even her, some of her tribal members about the role of natives in um, Cherokee society. But uh, Wilma was also uh, on our, the U of A campus many times, and I had the honor of having her speak to my class um, several times. And she, ex you know, was, uh, ex you know, shared some very uh, uh, wise wisdom and some real good uh, insight that my classes were fortunate to hear. Also, another political activism, which I'm uh, a person, which um, is, um, is LaDonna Harris. And LaDonna Harris is, is Comanche. And though LaDonna did never really did hold a polit uh, elected political office, she was very much involved in the political arena in DC because she was married to Fred Harris, who was a Senator from the state of Oklahoma. And so, you know, her, she was uh, present at, events and things that usually were not at that time um, for women, but she really did go out there and she, you know, uh, made her voice be heard on behalf of Indian people, promoting, you know, uh, civil rights and, and environmental and world peace kind of movements and, and, and then Indian rights. And, and she was really known as a spokesperson against poverty and social injustice. Uh, she was also the founder of the American uh, founder of American for Indian Opportunities. Uh, and she was also been on our campus and we have honored her in the, in the uh, women's uh, plaza here on campus. And this is a picture of her when she was, she came to, to be honored. And I had the, uh, the honor of introducing her uh, because she is a fellow uh, tribal uh, member. Also, another woman that's, that really has contributed to tribal governments and, and nation building within um, tribes is Mary Thomas. She was the governor of Gila River uh, Indian community, and she served you know, two terms as their governor and two terms as their lieutenant governor. But she was in office when Indian gaming was, um, you know, was an issue in Arizona, and it went up for the a vote uh, for the citizens of Arizona to, to vote on. And she really promoted how Indian, the profits from Indian gaming could really provide, you know, uh, basic services to the reservations. 
um, and help reservations with many of the uh, social economic situations they were in. And she would run ads on TV. So she you know, really became that, that spokesperson. And of course we know that Indian gaming does exist in Arizona now. But she, you know, was a woman, a, a Pima woman that really was respected because of her, her, her voice and speaking up and, and trying to do what was best for her people. Uh, again, she, we honored her at the, uh, the University of Arizona's Women's Plaza for her contributions uh, to Indian country. A current leader uh, is Vivian Juan Saunders. Uh, she is Taha Autumn, uh, and she now serves on the Legislative Council for her nation. But also, she was the first chairwoman of the Taha Autumn Nation and served at one term as a, their chairwoman. Uh, Vivian, you know, I've had the privilege to know Vivian for many years. Uh, when I first came back to the University of Arizona to work in the early 90s, uh, she worked for me. I was one of her supervisors. But, you know, politics was pulling her. And so she wanted to get into tribal politics. And so she left the university and, and has been in tribal politics ever since. And uh, not only with her own tribe, but with her uh, sister tribes uh, in the state of Arizona. And also been a spokesman at the national level. Um, so, you know, uh, she's someone that... Uh, that's been an honor for me to know because she has contributed so much. And she comes into my classes when I ask her to, to talk to, uh, especially Native women, because she feels like that, you know, that's something that she wants to, if she can help future generations, she sure wants to do that. And also, you know, we have policymakers now at the national level. We have uh, uh Deb Holland, uh, Holland, Holland and Sharice Davis. And we know that Deb has, you know, been recently um, appointed the first Native American and first Native woman to head the, the Department of the Interior. You know, and that's a real historical event because that hasn't happened before. You know, not Native women, a Native person hasn't had it, but now we have a Native woman also heading, you know. So that's, that's uh, something that um, um, we as Native people are very proud of her accomplishments and, and tribes really did back her nomination and, and now are willing, you know, excited about working with her because the Department of the Interior, you know, is where the Bureau, Bureau of Indian Affairs is housed, it's where the Park Service is housed, the BLM. These, these um, agencies that, you know, deal with issues in Indian country. So, you know, that's a very important position, uh, you know, but it's neat to have, you know, these women that were elected from their uh, states, you know, being elected first to the, the House, I mean, to the House of Representatives, and now, of course, going into the administration. Sharice, again, continues and represents uh, uh, her state and, and uh, uh, so we look forward, you know, to, to having more Natives at the national level. But what was really uh, significant to me is that when Holland was, was, appoint, was uh, elected to uh, the House of Representatives from New Mexico, you know, she gave credit to and acknowledged Native women who came before her, who ran for office before her, uh, including Ada Deer and... and uh, uh, Denise Stewart in, in Montana and um, others. So she acknowledged that, you know, people have paved the way for us. And, you know, and I thought that was very special because that isn't always done. Also, you know, in, uh, in, uh, in we see that another uh, thing that is happening in, in, uh, with, uh, in any country is the emphasis on uh, indigenous feminism. You know, uh, feminism in the beginning, you know, was more of a white woman's issue and native women were, did, were not, you know, did not really embrace it. 
even though we had women like uh, Man Killer and Aladonna uh, Harris who, you know, who acknowledged they were feminists. That hasn't always been the case, but we're seeing now that you know this this area of indigenous feminism is becoming more acceptable, and more Native women uh, are you know sometimes reluctant to to identify with it, but others are more freely feel like they can freely identify with it, and especially we see that there is scholarship on this you know, looking at bringing in uh, scholarships from a, uh, through a gendered analysis of indigenous women's lives. You know, how is that uh, an approach to look in and to study issues that are important? So we're seeing that, you know, this movement is, 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 uh, is really happening and especially taking off in the last 10 years, though it's been around for like 30 years. So, but, you know, when we think about indigenous feminisms, we are not, you know, it's really not the same as white feminism. Uh, Native people are thinking more of it's, it's, what is their responsibilities and their relationships to their communities, more than just kind of individual rights. Uh, and, you know, uh, you know, being equal to man, uh, that is not, you know, those philosophies of, of, of indigenous feminism. You know, it's, it's really, you know, often means uh, native activists. Yes, you're taking, you know, positions, you're trying to promote uh, and better your people. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's something that we're seeing more into the scholarship. But indigenous feminism is, is, is more flexible and fluid. They want to be more inclusive of all the different issues and the different types of genders and, and, and um, two-spirited people and all of these things into that, that, are, that are in our native communities. And then also just to restore and respect womanhood. You know, what was it, you know, how was it, how are women, we need to respect women, you know, uh, and, and one, that's one way of fighting domestic violence. That's one way of, you know, um, making the community healthier. So we see indigenous women as, as something that is more accepted now uh, and that is becoming a more of a contemporary issue. Also, we're seeing a kind of a new era of, of uh, activism and advocacy in higher education. And of course, as a person that has a degree in higher education, this has been of you know real interest to me. Uh, but we're seeing it also, you know, in the scholarship that's being produced and the in emerging scholars, native scholars also. So, you know, because that was kind of an interesting thing to me, and you know, I kind of wanted to do a little, take a little glance at this. So I kind of did a little quick pilot study and just kind of looked at, I wanted to look at American Indian female faculty in AIS, American Indian Studies, uh, you know, to see, you know, uh, what was happening in that area. Because we know that if you look at the history of American Indian Studies, our Native Studies, uh, you know, it developed out of activism and advocacy of the late 60s and, and early 70s, out of the Civil Rights Movement. You know, that's, you know, because of those pressures and things were happening in, 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 in that movement, you know, universities added these programs. Uh, so we're, we're seeing that happening. But when we look at the, you know, the statistics, you know, about native faculty in higher education, you know, we're, we compose less than 1% of all faculty. So a very small number, not even, not even 1%, but less than 1%. And in, you look at the statistics out of the National Center for Educational Statistics in, in 2018, there were 1,796 Native women at you know, all levels of uh, full professors, associates, et cetera, in the academy. So I wanted to look and see you know, some of these, some of the better known Indian studies programs in, our, in, in the country, uh, you know, this, course is not doesn't cover all the programs because there's over a hundred and some but just to look at a few to see how many uh how many native female uh faculties there they were on their 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 uh, 
core faculty, you know, permanent faculty, faculty that had tenure lines within their uh, programs. So you can see some of these numbers, you know, they're not, they're not great, but you know, they're out there. Well, you know, um, University of Oklahoma having seven uh, Indian female faculty members on their, their core faculty. Uh, ASU has six, which is great. Uh, but, you know, uh, UCLA has six, but, you know, of course, University of Arizona, we have three, we need more. But, you know, we're seeing, you know, well, how many are out there? Uh, and this is something that was of interest to me. So I wanted to, you know, to really look to see if, you know, they're, they're carrying on this activism and, and advocacy that, you know, the program was founded on. And in some of the things we've, we've seen with other, uh, with women in other areas in the political arena and ex, et cetera. And so, you know, uh, I was reading this article by Jeff Corntassel, who is a, a Cherokee scholar. And he, this article he wrote was, uh, he, he was talking about how he was interviewed for a job in a mainstream institution. And the committee thought he was really an activist posing as an academic, you know, looking at it more like a negative thing, you know, you can't be both, uh, you know, but yet, you know, can we be both? And so, and especially at this time, with things happening, the unrest, the racial kind of social justice issues that are happening in our culture right now, I kind of wanted to look at that. So, you know, I, 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 my question was, what responsibility to Native female faculty and AIS have to have to the communities they serve and study through their scholarship? You know, if we weren't in COVID-19, I could have done some interviews with these women, but, you know, that was, that was a limitation. But, and do they consider themselves scholar activists, you know? Uh, or is that something that, you know, that still is not accepted in the, in the academy. So, you know, I looked at some, the literature out there, you know, of course I didn't do an exhaustive study, but just taking a glance at some of the articles that have been written by Native women in AIS, uh, in some of our prominent uh, AIS journals and books and, and even dissertations and theses out there. And so what I found, in, you know, by doing this is, these list of things that they were writing about. Of course, health issues in, in the disparities in health issues in our, in our native communities, talking about community building. Of course, education, you know, uh, and access to education. Uh, some resistance, you know, these, so these were some of the things, native rights, women and missing and murdered women, uh, feminism, uh, revitalization, traditions, but also, you know, uh, relations with, with uh, Black and Indigenous relations and re Indigenous relations with other uh, uh, races and ethnic groups and looking at some common issues. So these were some of the things that, you know, that I saw they're writing about. So, you know, I, I, I kind of came to this conclusion, of course, you know, we do need to do some more in-depth study of this, but at least preliminary, you know, findings are that, you know, yes, uh, uh, these Native women in AIS, their scholarship is reflecting activism and advocacy, resistance, social justice topics of importance to Native communities. You know, so, you know, they are carrying on this, you know, this, this, uh, you know, this, this uh, trend of activism and, and advocacy that we have seen, you know, in different areas in, by Native women over time. But, you know, whether they consider themselves a scholar activist, which is kind of a new term out there, is really unknown because I didn't have a way to, to determine that without speaking to them or having conversations or sharing circles. That, that still needs to, to come. But, you know, they are carrying on the traditions of indigenous women before them. Uh, and then I started looking at, you know, who are some of these emerging 
uh, native women scholars in AIS. And of course, you know, some of them have been, are my colleagues and some of them have been my, my students. Uh, uh, and so, you know, I just wanted to show a few of those. Uh, 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 Aresta Sosipat, who does a lot of research on relocation, but also language revalorization. Uh, Georgina Bagoni, who's at New Mexico State, uh, you know, does a lot with Native artists and how they're using art, you know, to make statements and to promote uh, social justice. Uh, Cheryl Bennett, who's at, um, uh, uh, was at ASU, but it's uh, in Montana now, has done hate crime uh, scholarship. And of course, Kelsey John, and who's a part of our program at the University of Arizona, who does animal studies and that relationship to culture and to people. So, you know, these are real promising people, you know, that are coming out. And so I think, you know, future looks bright. Uh, we do need more women though in the field, in the academy. So some final thoughts. Uh, Native American women have always been influential in, the, in their societies. This is in the past and present. And I've tried to show some examples of that during this presentation. And I think that this continues today with a new era of activism and advocacy. They are players in issues that impact Indian country, mainstream society, especially in politics, activism, and culture. And you know, those efforts of assimilation and other things that, that happen to Indian people over time to alter this has not really succeeded. Uh, and you know. We're thankful for that. Uh, and so, you know, we see Native women as scholar activists or even sister scholars, you know, as Native women are, are earning that PhD and becoming, you know, uh, uh, get, entering the uh, academy, a lot of times they're forming networks and becoming sister scholars. That's a new uh, term also. They're leaders of social movements, political leaders, they're nurturing and supporting of their communities, but also they're at networking with other people on some common issues that pertain to, to all of us. So in closing, I'd like to, you know, uh, read this quote for you because I think, you know, it's very relevant. And of course it comes from uh, Wilma Mankiller. Uh, from the time of European contact, there has been a concerted attempt to diminish the role of indigenous women. But even with the sustained efforts by, um, by federal government and various religious groups to totally assimilate them, women continue to play a critical role in many indigenous communities in formal and informal leadership positions in every sector of tribal society and the larger culture around them. And I, you know, that I think that's just sums it all up, you know, in such a nice way. So I thank you for, you know, for, for listening. And I thank the, the, the museum for inviting me to present. Uh, I've enjoyed it very much. And I hope that uh, it's so, that you can take something away from this. So thank you. What do I, you do call in Comanche. Thank you very much. That was a phenomenal presentation. Thank you so much, Mary Jo. We have so many comments in the Q&A, um, uh, thanking you for your time. And, and one in particular said, thank you for including these women, acknowledging them and celebrating them. So thank you so much. And I do have a lot of questions and so, to let our audience members know, uh, we will get to uh, as many as we can. Those of you who do have your hands up, if you could type your questions in the Q&A, please. Uh, the first question is, do you have online classes that people from around the country could take? Well, because of, of, uh, of COVID-19, I did have classes online for the last, you know, year and a, year and a half. But, you know, at this point, um, the classes will be going back to in person and, and maybe in the future, you know, we will have online classes for people to take. Uh, I hope so, because I think that, uh, you know, uh, this last um, 
three semesters by teaching on Zoom, you know, I've learned that, you know, this is a good medium to reach people. Uh, and it, it, you know, and, and I've enjoyed it. So I hope that, you know, and I, I anticipate that our program will continue to have some online courses. So, you know, check us out. Maybe, you know, at, at some point I'll have this women's course online. I hope so. And do you cover native trans women in your class and the roles they play? Yes, I try to bring in that because I will know different gender variations in the communities. And, you know, in feminist scholarship, you know, that is a very important. And so I always try to bring in those kinds of issues because they're part of our communities. You know, they're a part of what's happening in Indian country. And we don't want to exclude them uh, and their issues. So, yes, I very much like to bring all of that in. Wonderful. Do you think the negative depictions of Native American women have contributed to the violence against them? Uh, do you, or perhaps in their uh, Anderson Campbell and Belcourt's work, do they postulate that? Oh, yes. You know, because, you know, women are, 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 um, they're not valued. They're, they're, they're objects to be, you know, to be exploited. Uh, and especially when um, non-Native men were not uh, having to be accountable for it uh, and not being convicted. And, and this is where these new laws against violence against women have come in, where at least now in Indian country, you know, they can, they can uh, uh, prosecute uh, non-Native men in certain circumstances. It's not to the extent what we want now. We need, but it is happening. Yes, but it is, it, these stereotypes are, you know, out there and they've been out there, you know, for sense contact that, you know, women are not valued, their property. Uh, and it really does, has uh, impacted the violence and even the missing and murdered women uh, uh, movements and, and situations in Indian country. And is it appropriate for a non-Native woman to wear red in order to help bring awareness? Oh, yes, because I think we, we, yes, I think so. You know, we need allies to promote this, you know, to make people aware of this and to come to some conclusions and solutions to, to, to deal with it. Yes, you know, I, I encourage my classes, you know, let's celebrate, you know, uh, May the 5th, and, you know, it doesn't matter if, you know, you don't have to be Native, only Natives do it. it. We want allies. We want people to support that movement. Yes. Wonderful. And with the increased use of social media, do you think this raises awareness on Native women's issues, or does it perhaps spread misinformation and perpetuate stereotypes and violence? I think it can be both. <laughs> You know, I think there's some really good things out there and, and some good, you know, uh, uh, information that is more correct and really is trying to make a difference and given a, a different uh, uh, image and uh, of Native women. But there's also still a lot of that other stuff that is just uh, continues to happen, you know, in social media that, uh, that promotes women as, you know, um, and as objects of uh, sexual objects, as, as uh, you know, uh, not worth anything as being, um, you know, those kinds of things are still there. Uh, and so there's still a lot of work to be done. Uh, so yeah, you know, good, good things are happening on social media, but also, you know, some, some things that are continuing to be uh, non-productive. And in general, how would you describe your students' reactions to your course and what concepts have they taken away the most? Well, overall, you know, they seem to very, they, they seem to um, enjoy it. Uh, many of the non-Native students that take the course just really aren't aware of the issues that uh, Indigenous women have and Native women have. Uh, and because they haven't been exposed to it. Uh, Native women um, that come to the class, a lot of times, um, 
use the class to really uh, maybe study and research and learn more about their tribal identity, whatever tribe they're, uh, they're in. Uh, and then to look at issues that, you know, that transcends all native country and, and native women. So I think, you know, it's, it's kind of an individual thing sometimes when they come in, what they get from the course. Um, but I think um, just being aware of, of, you know, some of these issues out there and the impact that native women have had on native cultures and have always had on native cultures is sometimes very uh, eye-opening to these students, uh, native and non-native, uh, because, you know, it's, it's, it's there and they just haven't been exposed to that scholarship or they haven't been exposed to uh, that viewpoint. Um, so, you know, hopefully they're all getting uh, uh, something from it. I hope so. Um, you know, and it's always gratifying to me to see, uh, you know, like I said, uh, the, the children of former students, <laughs> you know, and, and, uh, and, and they say, well, my mother took this course, you know, and so or my father took this course and, you know, they say, you know, I need to do this. So that, you know, that to me makes, makes me feel good, but it also makes me feel a little old too. <laughs> so, but anyway, I, I, I still enjoy it very much. Um, would you kindly say something about Indigenous women and nation-to-nation -nation diplomacy, please? Well, I think that, you know, we're seeing that, uh, you know, just the term Indigenous women, you know, has more of a global kind of uh, connotation to it as opposed to the American Indian women or Native American women. So we're seeing that, you know, there is beginning to be uh, more dialogue and more interaction between uh, women in different countries, uh, indigenous women in different countries, because there are some really common issues out there, uh, you know, in Australia and New Zealand. And, you know, we're seeing these, these dialogues happening and more of these relationships being, uh, formed, uh, and hopefully then that will help, you know, all Native women, all Indigenous women, wherever they are. So I think that that, you know, that um, outreach and, and that communications and those relationships that are being built, hopefully will help, uh, you know, uh, Indigenous women in their particular situations, uh, as well as uh, promoting uh, indigenous rights and indigenous women's issues, you know, uh, uh, globally and politically. I think we have time perhaps for two more questions. I, I'm receiving numerous questions regarding uh, readings. If you could kindly recommend <laughs> works by indigenous women about indigenous women. Okay. Uh... You know, I don't. I have a long, a long list of <laughs> of those readings, and I, I, you know, on um, um, university, my my syllabus, I list those, and on my my course pages, I list those. But I think that you know some of these ones that I used here for this presentation might be good uh, starting points for you to look at. And, and they're on the screen here, you know, the, the, the book by Kim Anderson about missing and murdered women, uh, critically sovereign indigenous gender and sexuality and feminist studies, you know, these kinds of, and then Ada Deer's life, you know. Uh, and then of course, Raina Deer uh, Green's book, uh, which happened in the, in the 90s is still a good kind of overview, women in American Indian society. And then uh, Mankeller's book, Every Day is a Good Day, Reflections by Contemporary Indian Women. These are, you know, these are books, you know, that you can get on Amazon and, and readily available, but they will give you, you know, uh, Anderson's, uh, Baker's, uh, um, uh, Deer's, Mankeller, uh, and Nichols are all Native women. You know, so we're beginning to see these these the scholarship out there by Native women being produced by Native women, and so I think that these would you know be a good start. 
And then, you know, if you're interested, there, there's also, you know, books like the, uh, uh, that are tribal Pacific about Native women, like uh, uh, Brenda Childs on uh, Ojibwe women. Um, and then there's some books on Cherokee women. Uh, you know, so there are some, uh, there's, there's quite a bit of, of scholarship on there, out there right now. And it's uh, pretty good. And, you know, I try to keep up with all, you know, because there's a lot coming out all the time. So for, because I'm teaching this class, I try to, you know, keep up with what's, what's out there. But I think and this would be a good start. Mm -hmm. And for our last question, I'll bring it local. <laughs> um, Betty would like to know where she can meet, support, and learn more about and from Native women in Tucson. Uh, you know, well, <laughs> I think, you know, um, I'm just trying to think about it. Uh, of course, there are, you know, the Tucson Indian Center, there are, um, you know, Native women at the University of Arizona. Uh, you can, um, there are student native uh, women student groups on campus. Uh, there are, you know, these marches that happen usually in January where you can meet native women, uh, you know, but, you know, there, it's, it's hard for me to say just to go to one Pacific place to meet them. Uh, you know, we're, we're a part of the Tucson community and we're involved in different parts of, of, of what's happening. But if there are cultural events, you know, like uh, the deer dances doing Easter at Paspayaki or, or uh, events put on uh, by uh, native groups in, in Tucson, and there are usually uh, those kinds of things happening, you know, attend them. Uh, you know, get to, to, to know some of the people that are involved in them and, and get to know some of the Native people that way. Uh, I hope that helps a little bit. I'm sure it does. Thank you so much, mm -hmm. Mary Jo, for, mm -hmm. again, it's, it was a phenomenal presentation and there are many um, words of thanks in the Q&A. And as a reminder to all of our registrants, you will be receiving a follow-up email within about three to four hours with a link to the video on YouTube. And if uh, we also have it posted on our Facebook page, it is streaming live right now. So if you want it a little quicker, you'll be able to find it there. Well, thank you, Mary Jo, it's been wonderful. And thank you, I, I appreciate you inviting me. And we hope to see all of you on June 19th at 11 a.m. Arizona time for our talk with photographer Priscilla Tacchini. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.